मंच पर बैठे श्री दयाल श्री लाभलाल श्री जाजो श्री अरविंद सिंह सभागार में बैठे माननीय चतुर्वेदी जी जनरल मालिक देवी और सचिव मैं पुरानी पीढ़ी का हूँ और हमारी शिक्षा दीक्षा अंग्रेजों के जमाने में हिंदी मेरी मातृभाषा है किंतु किसी जटिल समस्या पे अपने विचार रखने में मुझे अंग्रेजी में ज़्यादा सुविधा हो इसलिए मैंने ये अनुरोध किया था कि मैं अपने विचार आपके सामने अंग्रेजी में वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग द मार्टिडम वीक ऑफ द वेरी ग्रेट इंडियन सुपार टाइम डॉक्टर श्यामा प्रसाद मुखर्जी आई रिकॉल those gory days of partition when the integrity of india the security and peace of india suffered so brutally at the hands of partition holocaust millions died millions were uprooted and i had the misfortune of seeing this for 3 months from a moving train in punjab at that time all that was the outcome of the two nation theory soon after we were faced with another problem an emerging three nation theory in kashmir they did not fight a war every effort was made to promote a three nation concept and it was there that dr shama prashad mukherjee made a good contribution in arresting that process as you all know the permit system which is almost like a visa had to be obtained for an indian from the mainland going into kashmir the national flag was not flown in kashmir and of course there is a separate constitution separate sadhana aasan for the president and so on and his martyrdom arrested that process the permit system was abolished national flag could be flown along with the state flag and even today kashmir is the only state where both flags have been flown and what is more certain other amendments were brought in as a result of his martyrdom the jurisdiction of the supreme court of the election commission of the comptroller and auditor general was extended to cash all india services like ips and ias were now being deputed to serve of course article 370 which was initially a temporary provision in our constitution for political reasons continues to be retained to 
today I'd like to share my views with you on the trips to the identity and security of our nation, which is the subject on which I've been asked to speak. Well, in specific terms, there are three major threats which I'd like to touch upon. The first is Pakistan, second is China, it's not in any order of priority, and the third is the moist menace, what the Naxals are doing. So far as Pakistan is concerned, I shall begin by saying that the origin and history of Pakistan is one of relentless hostility towards India, which is now seen in the intense hate India attitude developed by that country. Sir Sayyid Ahmad, the founder of Aligarh Muslim University, on 16th March 1888, had said something very pertinent. He had said that Hindus and Muslims are two nations. They cannot sit on the same throne and rule. One of them has to rule. And implying that Muslims should rule over India, he had said that our co-religionists and friends in the mountain valleys will descend like a swarm of locusts converting the area from the frontier to Bengal into a river of blood. That was 1888. Mr. Jenner was very disappointed in what he got in Moth Eaton Parks. He was playing for bigger stakes. But undeterred, he thought he would prove Sir Sayyid Ahmed's views by unleashing a locust of Pathans into Kashmir on 22nd October. 1947. Had better sense prevailed on him and his generals, he should have delayed this operation by seven days. If he had done it on 29th of October, the story would have been entirely different. The Kashmir Valley who got isolated from the rest of India because of snow. There was only a grass airfield at Srinagar in those days and there was no tunnel in Malaya. He did us a favor by starting the operation on the 22nd of October. We were taken totally by surprise and against all odds we miraculously rescued the Kashmir Valley. The window of opportunity was 15 days and I was personally associated with that operation. We flew in 800 civilian Dakota sorties from Safdarjang Airport 
to the glass air field at Srinagar. On the first day when we landed on 27th October, our total strength at the airport was only 300 soldiers and the enemy was 10,000 strong in Baramala. But we built a fast strength and drove the enemy out of the battle. And thereafter, a series of blunders followed. We moved from one folly to another promising that people of Kashmir will be allowed to determine their future. There's no requirement for it, no legal requirement. Going to the United Nations, stopping the army on 14 November at Uri, otherwise Muzaffarabad should have been with us in November 47 and so on. Now all that is past. What is the present? And before I talk about the present, let me remind you of a very painful fact of our history. From 999 AD, when Muhammad Ghazni started his incursions into India, till the end of the colonial era, that is 1947, we were subjugated repeatedly through our own weaknesses. It's interesting that Field Marshal Montgomery in his book World History of Warfare, it's a magnum opus. He has written that the Indians, particularly the Rajputs, their fighting class, they were very gallant and chivalrous in battle. They would die for their country, but did not win for their country. That is a painful fact of history. And more recently, George Tenham, an U.S. expert on strategy, has said that Indians lack a sense of a strategy. And I'm afraid in our dealing with these three threats that we have before us, Pakistan, China, and the Naxal menace, we have perhaps conformed to the weakness that has been pointed out to us by outsiders. Now let us Take the case of Pakistan. Kashmir has been the major irritant. But in the last 66 years, I can say this from personal knowledge and experience that we have really had no policy on Kashmir other than just parroting Kashmir is an integral part of India. We have no road map on how to solve the problem. And as I said, we continue from one folly to another scoring repeated self goals. Now generally our relations with Pakistan. Psychologically, Pakistanis felt, I have been feeling, that they are descendants of the Central Asian conquerors who came to India 
and subdued India for over 700 years. They forgot that they are virtually descendants of the indigenous people of India. They are of the same stock as we in India. The sense of martial superiority got a jolt in Kashmir, received a setback in 1965 and was shattered in 1971. Yet their hostility towards India continued unabated, if not got accelerated. Ziaul Haq started the strategy of a thousand cuts, to bleed India to death, whether in Kashmir or the rest of the country. That is still their strategy. Now all that is past. What is the present? There are two interesting developments. Nawaz Sharif has become the Prime Minister and has been making friendly noises. We should welcome it, but we cannot afford to take it at its face value. We cannot ignore his past record. We cannot ignore the fact that even now his brother has given a huge grant to the master terrorist Hafiz Muhammad Saeed. So we have to watch before election. We must not lower our guard. The other development is the situation in Afghanistan. The Americans are supposed to quit next year. They are looking for an honorable exit. How do they face this challenge? We have made a lot of investments in it, Afghanistan. Economic development in a big way. We must continue with that to gain their goodwill. The force, the big question arises, what happens if tomorrow a Taliban government gets installed in Kabul? Well, we should have our plans to meet that challenge. In the worst case, we have a section of Afghanistan. Northern Afghanistan, which can remain friendly to us. But we should welcome a friendly government in Afghanistan at all times, as far as possible. It's a very big challenge. That challenge has to be met. Now, talking of Afghanistan, my memory goes back to 1948, January. I was an operations staff officer in Western Command, which was conducting operations in Kashmir and was also responsible for the defense of Punjab and northern Rajasthan. We were asked to prepare a plan for the defense of India. I did a lot of work on it. There are other seniors and colleagues who helped. 
But it was headquarters mostly of British officers at that time. The commander was a British general. I have been a student of military history. I worked on what Napoleon had once said, and also what Chanakya had written in his Earth Chart. Napoleon had said that no war can be won by defensive action alone. Wars are won by offensive action. A person who likes to be strong everywhere and hopes to win the war through defensive action will ultimately find himself strong nowhere. So when we defend India or Punjab against Pakistan, we should keep that in mind. And what had Chanakya said? Chanakya had said that your enemy's enemy is a friend. In 48, Afghanistan and Pakistan had inimical relationships. Durand line was not acceptable to Afghanistan, which had been imposed by the British. We had a very friendly leader in Afghanistan at that time, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. So, in my small way of thinking, I had said while defending Punjab and Northern Rajasthan, we should have a strike force we should go from Jaisalmer, 60 miles, on to Sakar Barat. All the north-south road and rail communications of Pakistan pass through this bottleneck. Secure Sakar, and you have cut Pakistan into two, and northern Pakistan becomes a landlocked country like Afghanistan. And for doing so, cultivate the geo Sindh movement that was ongoing at that time. The Sindhis wanted independence. And also, of course, friendly relations with Afghanistan. I was told by my seniors that I was being foolish and I should destroy all the paper that I had written. Now I'm referring to this because day before yesterday I saw news in the papers that a study group in Pakistan has come out with a view. It says that Indians are guided by Chanakya's philosophy. They have a lot of respect and regard for him. Their posh diplomatic locality in Delhi is called Chanakya Puri. So their thinking is based on Chanakya's tactics. And today, they are reaching out to Afghanistan and also to Israel in pursuit of Chanakya's philosophy. And what is more, they are threatened by China. And there they are trying to reach out to Vietnam and Japan. After reading it, all that I could say that I wish we Indians and our predecessors were really guided by Chanak Had we done so, things would not have been so bad as they are. Now I come to China. The pendulum of power till 1947 
was heavily weighted towards the south of the Himalayas. The mighty British Empire in India, which is now splintered into four independent states. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Burma. North of the Himalayas, there was a splintered China with too many warlords fighting amongst each other. But all that changed when the monolithic power emerged in China under Mao Zedong. And the Chinese thinking of Middle Kingdom. This has dominated their thinking for centuries. The heaven is the upper kingdom, the high kingdom, China is the middle kingdom, and the rest of the world are barbarians, the lower kingdom. And translated today, they are dreaming of becoming the supreme power, supreme world power of the 21st century. An objective they may well reach in the next 30, 40 years. Be that as it may, from 1950 onwards, they took an aggressive posture towards India. They moved troops into Tibet and Sardar Vallabhai Patel in his letter of 17th December 1950 written a few weeks before he died warned Jawaharlal Nehru to be prepared for Chinese threat that was totally ignored Jawaharlal Nehru was very magnanimous at that time. He withdrew all the privileges that we had in Tibet. Our military guns at Gyamse and Lhasa, our consulates, our posts and telegraphs in Tibet. And handed everything on a platter to the Chinese without any reciprocity. We even declined permanent membership of the UN Security Council saying that should legitimately go to China. Well, he was a visionary playing the role of promoting world peace. Like 2000 years earlier Ashoka had done. But he forgot one thing. Ashoka promoted world peace from a position of military strength. He had almost a million standing army. The figure was 750,000, which no country in the world had at that time. And we tried to play this game from a position of military weakness. Frederick the Great had said that that is like playing a concert without any musical instruments. Someone else said that is like playing water polo in a tank without water. There's total mismatch between our military strength and diplomacy. 62 was the result. Now, that debacle could have been avoided. We committed tactical suicide with our forward policy, with our unpreparedness to fight the Chinese. But that is all history. Since we have strengthened ourselves and we have achieved some results, the Chinese, I feel, are basically bullies. 
1967, there was an artillery duel in North Sikkim, and we got the better of it. In 1986, they moved their forces to Chungdu Valley, and we moved larger forces and virtually encircled. So, we have to be tough. Unfortunately, the recent Debsang incident, I do not see why we treated in that manner. The Chinese were supposed to have come 19 kilometers inside our tent, or what we claim to be our tent. Well, there's a dispute about that. Both Indian patrols and Indian patrols move around in this area. But what was new? They put up three tents indicating they wanted to stay there. And this face off continued for 19 days. We responded, we also went there. And at the end of it, both sides withdrew. They are far ahead of us militarily. We have also improved our position, but our efforts have been very sluggish. We do not have to enter into an arms race with China, but we must have sufficient strength to de deter military adventurism. We must break that pearl of uh, ring, sort of string of pearl strategy reach out to Charbahar on the west to neutralize Gorda Airport, uh, Gorda Port with Pakistan, China is developing in Pakistan, reach out to Japan, reach out to Vietnam. Now lastly, I'll touch on the next minutes. For the last six, seven years, the Prime Minister has rightly been saying that Naxal menace is the biggest threat to our national strategy, to the integrity of our country. But we seem to have done precious little about it. I want to emphasize that the Naxal violence to counter it, we must get rid of our normal approach of maintaining law and order. The Naxals have declared war on the Indian state, on the Indian constitution, and on Indian democracy. It has, been, it has to be tackled like a war. Interestingly, I'll just give you certain data. In broad daylight, in Orissa, Korapet, the raid at district headquarters, a police armory, and walk away with 500 rifles. In Bihar, they raid a central jail at Jahanabad. Get their colleagues out and free all the prisoners. This again in broad light, daylight in the district of Kormos. And most recently you must have read about firing on a railway train in Jammu. Now what is the position? We have a red corridor from Bihar, Nepal border through several states, Jharkhand, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, and on to Maharashtra. 23 districts are affected, and 200 police stations are dominated by them. 7,000 square miles of forest 
has become their haven. There are 20,000 fully armed Naxals and 50,000 overground workers. You know the sort of things that happen. 125 CRP policemen in 2010 killed in Dantebar. The Congress VVIP convoy massacred on 26th of May. The Naxos are working under a unified command. The People's War Group and Moise center, they have unified. And we are working on a different footing. All the states, affected states, are fighting their own private war. Each chief minister decides how that war is to be fought. When the other side does not respect your interstate boundaries, so what is required? a coordinated and effective policy from the center and in regions cutting across interstate boundaries with a lot of professional expertise to be provided by retired army personnel, redoubts in the jungle, air maintained, impregnable, with air support if necessary, and squeeze them out. And as you squeeze them out, do your development. That is the sort of thing we need to do. In conclusion, I would like to mention that we cannot afford to take any of these threats lightly. It's not a political issue. It is a national issue. And all of us must put our best foot forward to deal with this. And so far as Naxals are concerned, if we don't do that, the fate of Kumintan awaits the Indian government. Thank you.